My guest today uh, is one of those people who appears on lists, power lists, of people who are influential and doing great things. He uh, funds black Britons going to university. And no, I'm not talking about Stormzy. I'm talking about <laughs> somebody who, who you may not have heard of. His name is Rick Lewis. He's an investment fund manager. Uh, and he was voted the most powerful, influential black Briton for 2019 recently on, on, on you know, the, the list, the, the power list. Um, wh why, why do you think you got that accolade, first of all? Are you, do you think you are the most powerful black Briton? Well, I, I think um, the actual ranking of individuals is less important than what Michael Aboda and Powerless have really been doing. I think that they've been creating a community that celebrates ourselves, at some level providing our own pastoral care to ourselves, which is great. Um, I think, you know, why did I wind up on the list? Because I think I've decided to sort of take myself out of my comfort zone and move a few stones to help build the proverbial village that changes things, little and large. Um, and I think over time, some of that's become a little bit more known. And I think when you have that effect on young people and those young people are growing up to make waves of their own, then you get noticed. So, you know, to some extent, um, a product of the reflected glory. If I can speak bluntly, our community hasn't done as well as other communities. We haven't bonded together to trust each other with our livelihoods, with our resources, to go and make change as well as other ethnic communities have. And so it's, I'm really proud to see us be, be doing it here. And help each other. And help each other. The way other. other ethnic minorities often do. Exactly right. You know, I, I talked, uh, and I have talked plenty of times about creating geometric change, you know, like one and one getting together, not to create two, but three, three plus three, equaling 10, 10 plus 10, equaling 100. That's not bad maths. That's a vision. That's a belief. And I think that we don't do it as well as some others. I mean, I've been, you know, I was at, and I, and I want to be careful about how I said this, I was at uh, a function of another ethnic community that gets together on a regular basis to support each other. And it was a, a big dinner, and there were about 300 people in the room. And uh, a gentleman was up talking, and the two people that were sitting next to me actually said, God, this guy's a windbag. We really don't even like him. A couple minutes later, he asked for an appeal for the room to support something in the community. And in, in about 15 minutes, they raised three million pounds. And I turned to one of the guys and said, you don't even like the guy. Like, why did you, why did you give him money? He said, because I don't have to like him to like his idea or to know how important it is to our community. I'd like to see our community do more of that. We're doing some of it now, but I think we can do even more. Well, I mean, look, the first thing, look, there's a lot, a lot there I want to come back to, but the first thing people are going to notice if they're listening to this or if they're watching this is um, he doesn't sound British. Right. So, um, so tell us where you're from and what you Yeah, so, what, so, I'm, so I, I grew up just outside of Boston. I'm American and my accent probably is a pretty good cue to that. I came over here about 20 years ago. Um, I want to say, you know, related to our last question, you know, I've seen the face of philanthropy and community involvement change or collective consciousness change. When I first got here um, in this country, I would go to fundraisers. because so I've been doing the work I've been doing in the community at the nexus of education and under-resourced uh, children for a long time, um, you know, programs in the States. And I wanted to do the same thing when I moved here 20 years ago. Um, but the fundraisers I went to when I first got here were all about animals or lifeboats. You know, I mean, truly, I mean, great organizations, mm. but, and I would say- they are, they are British obsessions. They are, perhaps so. And I would say, but what about the children? And people would say, dear, they're in boarding school. And I would say, no, no, what about the, the poorer children, the under-resourced children? They said, well, we really don't know them. Now I'm being a little facetious, but the conversation has changed, you know, about skills, about, aspiration about achievement and people helping each other. And I think that's been a really positive change. I witnessed and was a product of that change in the US. And so to come here and see that evolution and to be able to play a part in it has been pretty meaningful to me. In what way, what was your childhood like? What kind of family did you come from? Um, so a uh, middle-class family, my father, a firefighter, my mom, a clerk in the telephone company, good hardworking folks that showed me the power of hard work. I mean. You know, I'm a product of the post-civil right 1960s USA, where um, despite the prejudices and imbalances of the prior time and me suffering some along the way, too, um, I also um, saw, you know, I had an appreciation for how hard my family had to work to, to bootstrap itself. 
Um, but my family, you know, my parents in particular were hardworking and generous. And what, the, one of the things that I think is most meaningful to me is that as I started to explore new things that change what I call my aspiration bubble, they were supportive of it. My work in the community, sometimes I see parents who struggle as their children's are, children are becoming more um, classically educated than they are or experiencing more things than they are or traveling more than. And my parents were great. You know, they didn't always understand what I was getting into or the worlds that I was traveling into, but they always encouraged me to do more. Um, so, so that was my background. Well, I, were you always the bright, the bright boy? Were you the bright kid in the class? Um, I was always one of the bright boys in the class, but you know, you, you, know, you only come to know that over time, and that's part of my story. Um, and it's part of what feeds my work about talking about aspiration and aspiration bubble. So I was, you know, I grew up in a predominantly white community. My family was one of the few sort of uh, minority families in my community. Why was that? Uh, it's just where we, just where we were, yeah, where we were growing up, yeah, where we were, where we were located. Um, and um, my, as I said, my dad was one of the first sort of uh, black men on the fire department in that community. Um, and um, I was a very good student. I was president of my class. No one kind of told me that I was different or I, you know, I didn't understand in the way. I mean, certainly I suffered small prejudices, but um, there was something curious about me that thought like, well, why wouldn't I do this? Um, and I, um, I, I had a moment that really feeds a lot of the work I do. I was uh, in my you know, ultimate year of high school and was planning on going to university. Now, two years prior to that, I actually didn't know what the Ivy League was. That's like growing up here and not knowing what Oxford and Cambridge or the Red Bricks are. I went to the school library and actually looked up what the Ivy League was. And I was in the hallway um, of my high school and the director of guidance, the people that are associated with helping sort of the further education or experience of kids after children after they graduate high school came up to me and said, what are you gonna do next year? And I said, very proudly, like I'm gonna to go to university. He kind of slapped me in the head and said, of course you are with your grades and stuff, but what university are you gonna to go to? I was a product of uh, perhaps a guidance counselor that had worked too many years and had seen too many children and gotten tired and bored. And uh, he had me applying to schools that in retrospect were well below my potential. So the head of guidance said, look, here's a permission slip, go get this signed by your parents. And the next week he took me to a college fair in Boston at Northeastern University and walk me table to table to some of the best universities in the States. Uh, and they all kind of responded and said, please apply to our college or university. And so I did, I got into everyone. And that's the beginning of somebody who outside of my own family stepped in to care to change my perspective on what was possible for me and change what my, my aspiration bubble was. And, and that was just based on him knowing your grades or him knowing you personally or what? Him knowing me personally by far. I mean, you know, he was head of guidance for the city, so he knew I was class president. He had interacted with the student council. He knew my grades, so he knew I had potential there. So, he, But, you know, he took the time to connect those moments that changed drastically my vector in life. I don't mean that I wouldn't have had a very good life, but it would nowhere have been the life that I have right now. So you ended up going to Dartmouth, which is an extremely exclusive university in the United States, one of the smallest universities right. uh, in that sort of elite crowd. I mean, as soon as you're, you're there, you're sort of on the road to success, aren't you? Yeah, but you have to know that, right? And that's what changed. That was the eureka moments for me at Dartmouth. I got to Dartmouth and of course it was gonna be challenging and helpful educationally. I mean, again, my, my family didn't know what it opens up. I mean, Dartmouth has an incredible alumni network, which was going to change my life. It is one of the best colleges or universities in the States, which was going to change my life, but I didn't have an awareness of this. What changed for me at Dartmouth is my idea of understanding my own potential. You know, when we look at the children we work with, there are five critical ingredients, I think, that really take you from changing from potential to the path to greaterness. The first is experience, getting outside of the realm of your own experience so that you can say, hey, this is something I'm interested in. The second one is aspiration, you know, starting to think like, actually, I want to be in this movie. The third is belief, believing that you deserve to be in the movie, the fourth resources and the, and the fifth support, you know, care and feeding and pastoral support, et cetera. But for me at Dartmouth, I got there and, you know, my roommates were accomplished 
um, or their families were accomplished. You know, one of my roommates, you know, when and buddies, his father and grandfather both went to Dartmouth and they were CEOs on Wall Street, et cetera. I started to look around and started to experience in some subtle and not so subtle ways that if these are the sons and daughters of the captains of industry and the arts and science, I want in. You know, if these lovely, friendly knuckleheads are the ones that are going to take over the world, I want to be one of those knuckleheads. A lot of kids would have been intimidated by that. So why weren't you intimidated? Did you just have a sort of an intellectual confidence? Or? Well, I think retrospect, I mean, retrospect is perfect, right? So I'm sure there, there were moments where I, I was I should also say you're extremely tall, so that maybe has something to do with yeah. it as well. But. Well, to some extent, I think, I think what, what happens or, you know, by chance. So, uh, so first I would say retrospect is perfect, right? So I'm, cer I'm certain that I was intimidated in moments, you know, and I can probably conjure up or remember something. You know, I just didn't feel comfortable, and you had to work your way through that. But I think there's a couple things. I think... Growing up in the community I did, in an all-white community, without knowing it, I probably learned some skills, not how to fit in, but how to excel in places. I think that one of the skills that I've learned or grown to be good at is being able to, uh, to be very comfortable in environments that aren't my own, you know, to adapt pretty quickly. I think that's one of, one of the things. I think the second thing is that you, in those moments, draw on things that you are good at. So I had basketball and being part of the basketball team and part of a community that would anchor me as I were exploring other things. And then I think there's just part of me that is probably just cheeky, which is I don't mind getting in and mixing it up and building relationships. I think moving over to this country was that moment. When I first moved here, people would be like, well, that's lovely. You're a Yank. When will you be going back? And then a couple of years later, they go, you did what? Right. And some of my friends, some of my friends are some of the biggest sporting athletes in England. And um, I think the reason I became friends with them is because I have that cheeky attitude where we'd be playing golf or another sport. And I wasn't like, well, you're the greatest batsman in cricket history. I was like, you owe me 10 quid, mate. Fast pay makes fast friends. You need to pay me now. And I think there's a little piece of me that's like that. But um, I'm sure I was intimidated as everyone is in those situations. What, why do you think your own experience is 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 one that so many other young black British kids can learn from? Because I, I think w when I talk to them, I say, I am no different than you. I'm from the same background. There is nothing special about me that you don't already possess. You know, I think it really is about determination. I think the world has a deep desire to try and help if you want to untap it, to try. I really believe that, that the world will help people that are committed semi-talented, ambitious, hardworking triers. And I say, that's what you need to do. You need to be a trier. But there are some key ingredients. I talk a lot about, to young people, about trying to make sure that they're the one or one of the few. And what I mean by that is a lot of people, for very good reasons, get in their own way. Um, they, a story I tell, you know, or ask them, and I'm in these situations, I said, when you wake up in the morning, is there anyone standing by their bed blocking you from getting to the bathroom? And they said, no, 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 what are you talking about? Of course not. I said, when you get to the bathroom, is anyone blocking you from getting your toothbrush or the face cloth or getting into the shower or the bath? They're like, no, mate, that was, why would someone be there? I said, that's right, no one's waking up playing man-to-man -man defense on you in your life. Most of the time, it's you, fear, lack of motivation, that's causing you not to move forward. If you know that the world will help you if you're one of those good, well-intentioned, committed triers, why wouldn't you do everything you know, in your capacity to make sure you're one of the few people that people want to help? We have this saying in, in my foundation and in, in the work we do, unlimited love, limited time, which means that like we've got love and respect and care for everyone, but the world forces you to ration your time, your energy, your resources, so you, we, all of us have to make sure that we put ourselves to be one of the few that people want to help and get the reflected reward and glory of helping because that's the path to moving forward. I mean, we, we skipped a huge chunk of your life, the bit where you became hugely successful and, yeah. um, and, and, and very wealthy. I mean, um, what, what should we say about that um, that's, that plays into this story of success and what people can learn from it? Um, I think, I think I, as I was saying before, I think I'm a trier. I think I moved myself. I mean, the fact that I had a successful or emerging career in the U.S. and moved myself over here to start a new and start a new business. I mean, those are the things that 
you know, that's taking a risk. And I think there are moments where you take a risk that can be well rewarded. I think that um, um, I'm sure I'm, I've always been a hard trier. I think that uh, I don't think I have more special creativity than somebody else. Um, and, and I think that's, that's what people should take from it. Is there a sort of a political vision underlying it, though? I mean, because you're sort of, in a way, you sound like sort of quite the traditional um, successful capitalist who then becomes a philanthropist and wants to help people and give some of your money away to help the less fortunate. Um, is, it, is it as straightforward as that? or is? I don't know. I don't think I'm more special than anyone else, but I do have this feeling that I've always traveled with. It comes from my family. I mean, first, I think I have... I have a deep appreciation for the struggles of the people before me that made me possible. I mean, I, you know, I don't know if that's different from other people, but I know I carry that with me. You know, I can see what my parents sacrificed. I know what my grandmother did. My grandmother sat me down early in my life. I've told this story before. And she said, um, it takes a village to build greatness, to build a single point of greatness. And I've made a sacrifice to move some stones to help you and your brothers, your cousins, your parents. And so go build me a village. So I've always been imbued with this notion of like, look, I was given something and I need to give back. So there's that part. The second part is I also have a deep appreciation that the time is now. I mean, we can complain about what's going on. You know, I mean, there's prejudices, talk about race, and there's plenty of problems in today's world. But I am very, very sure that I want to be doing and acting in this now versus 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 150 years ago. And everyone that I ask this question, would you rather be playing in the game now or would you rather step into your parents or grandparents or great parents' shoes? Everyone picks now. So you know, I, have a, I have an excitement that this is the time to be making change. You know, I think um, that's part of it. Um, I mean, it's interesting that several minutes here, we, we, haven't, we haven't talked about racism. Um, and, and so is, is that because you perhaps think that uh, self-belief and confidence and hard work are bigger obstacles, if you like, than racism and prejudice? No, I think they're equal things. I mean, if I think about the three things that I'm working on outside of work that are my passions. One's the educational philanthropy and providing, removing barriers to aspiration and achievement for young people. Um, the second is empowering our community to do a much better job of amassing resources. Um, and we're in the process of creating a fund to do that. And, you know, just, you know, by us, for us, with us, and alongside us. The third is diversity and inclusion. And I think that, you know, I'm trying to think about how to expand my footprint, you know, personally, corporately, professionally, and in the community to do that. I think they're all equal issues, you know, um, Part of what informs me when I was a kid, another story when I was kid, watching cartoons with my brothers, and I don't know how, how much it was on air here, but there's a cartoon, The Flintstones, yeah, you know, sure. prehistoric, right? And I was watching The Flintstones, and there's no brown people, no black people in The Flintstones. And then an hour later, I was watching The Jetsons. Futuristic, you know, what the world was gonna become, and there's no brown people in, in, in The Jetsons. And I thought, God, there's no brown or black people in the past or in the future. So there's a problem with either the story or the storyteller. Like it's only years later that I realize it's both. And so I think your point is, um, I don't mean to say that, that there isn't real issues here and they're ones that I take off, that ones that I have suffered, walked around, bent around, jumped over, and they're real issues. So, you know, I tell a lot of the children that we work with, the struggle's real, but it's not going away. It's about how we deal with the struggle and remember, the time's now, and it's much better than it was. It may get much better, but you need to play a role in that. Why would you say it's much better than it was? Well, because I think I'm, I'm talking about a long-term historical perspective. I mean, if you really think about it, if I think about where my family was 150 years ago, and I don't want to be flippant about this, but someone probably owned us, right? I mean, so like, it is better now, no question. Um, whether it's better today than it was three years ago, that is certainly up for debate, right? But what I like about today, well, not like about today, what I'm, I'm pleased that we are, is there's a conversation about what's going on. Whether it's the Me Too movement, whatever, no matter where your perspective is on how far the pendulum has swung, far enough, not far enough, more to do, we're having the conversations. And they're hard and they're painful and sometimes ugly and costly, but we're having conversations that we didn't have. Um, there's miles to go before we sleep, for sure, but we're in the conversation. I mean, you you work in in, in the investment right. 
world. You have, I'm sure, lovely offices in Mayfair. Uh, how many people like you are there in your world? Um, not enough. Um, uh, I grew up in business in the States. And when I started it, there was very few of me there. Now when we're in the States, there's a lot of me there. So I've seen the change over 30 years. I'm not saying there's enough, but there's, there's a good representative view, a uh, good representative collection of us, however we want to define us or me. In the US. In the US. I, I don't mean it's enough, it can always change, but, and it's from top to bottom. There's people, in, so we, we're making progress. Uh, when I came over here, I would go to a conference, you know, in the real estate private equity world, and there'd be 500 people there, and it would be just me if I measured it as brown people. I mean, if I measured it to brown males, just me, you know, I mean, a need for change. Now, that is changing and has changed, but we need to continue to do more and be open to more. You know, myself and at Tristan, we have a very international business. So we're from 20 countries and speak 25 languages. So, you know, in terms of diversity, we have a lot of diversity, but, you know, I'll be very open about this. You know, I, we still don't have enough brown people. I mean, not that there's a quota or whatever, but I, I know the intake, the opportunity, the collection of people in our industry um, is still small. And so we're trying to work at the grassroots level and outreach to try and bring people in the industry to help them understand the pre-qualifications that they'll need to be successful. But that's no different than I look at our business and while I think we're better than the industry averages, which is a nice pat on the back, we don't have enough senior women in our leadership. We're working on that too at every level of our firm. So there's plenty of work to do. Do you believe in positive discrimination? Um, I believe in positive consideration. Maybe that's a way to think about it. I, I don't want to think about discrimination. I mean, uh, it's a tricky question because I know that at some point I was, I was the beneficiary of someone being open-minded enough to say, you know what, on this coin flip, let's take the kid that's brown. And so I want to be open to positive consideration on that coin flip. But, um, but I understand if the pendulum swings too much, that can be harmful too, where you're picking people because they have a certain characteristic, but they're not as qualified as somebody else, you know, I, I want to be open to positive consideration. So on, on, well, what, what you say is the, the, the coin flip. So what you're talking about there is if you have two candidates the same. Right. But the truth is, no two people are ever the same, are they? I mean, No, but sometimes the differences can be hard to discern, right? You get two people from the same school, the same academic background, the same scores. You know, I, the reason I know this is I look at the intake at, you know, elite U.S. universities. You know, the university I went to got 24,000 applications for 22,000 spots for a class of 1,100. I mean, the admissions process by which they're trying to figure out how to build a diverse and inclusive population, and they're looking at those, and there are moments where the, the candidates have to be virtually inseparable in terms of, you know, trying to figure out who could be better. So you start having to think about curating for the type of environment you want. You know, what are you, what are you trying to create? What do you want to be? What does the whole look like? How could this person or this group of people stretch you to be a better whole? And that's, that's part of the coin flip, I think. Why have you decided that the best way to help young people is to help them get into elite universities? It, I, don't, I haven't, it's just one of the ways. And it's one of the ways that, you know, if you go back to what I was saying about my grandmother saying, go build a village and knowing that like, you know, if you can start to move some stones, it's part of the village. I'm just moving the stones that I'm comfortable and knowledgeable. About. Because that's what happened to you basically, is, is that what? Yeah, I mean? so I, I have the personal experience of knowing it works. I now have the personal experience and professional experience of seeing it work in the community as I've been doing it. And it's my familiarity, um, it, it, you know, as I was thinking about coming on today, I was thinking, sort of, you know, what is the one thing that I would want to be different if I could pick one thing of ways to change the world? The notion that I come up with is, if I could get one wish, it would be that everybody moved out of their realm of personal experience, their, their family environment, and figured out what one stone that do they want to be responsible for moving. I mean, I, you know, I have great friends that have been so supportive of the initiatives that I have embarked upon financially and otherwise, but they sometimes can rationalize how busy they are to not figure out 
what they'll personally get involved in. And if I could get five minutes to five days of everybody's time to figure out little or large, professional or personal, those things that they would do to move their one stone, we would attack and solve a lot of life's problems. And so what is your stone? I think my stone is removing the barriers to aspiration and achievement for talented people. I feel like not only is that helping in education and, and creating a better, more thoughtful community, but it's also building an army of people that want to make change. All of the people I've helped now, maybe because we're charming or maybe because they're so thankful, but I know they're imbued with a responsibility that I got imbued in me by my grandmother. If I ask them, you know, will you help out with this? Will you pay it forward? Will you get involved to a person? Every young man and young woman is saying, yes, absolutely. So you're paying their, their tuition fees? I'm paying part of the tuition fees. What we do is basically close the gap between what they can afford and what they want to do. And that's why I've said, you know, sometimes I have that eureka moment that feels like, you know, like I'm playing Black Santa, like I'm sitting around and you know, I have the emotional moment where someone's telling you their life story and how close they are to achieving their dream and you're closing the gap. I mean, who, who would have thought that I'd get to play a role in that? Or, I mean, when I say me, I mean me, my friends, my colleagues, the other people that work in the foundation, my family. But how big a gap do you think that cost of tuition fees is? I mean, how, how big a hurdle is it it's for the kinds of people you're talking about? Because... As you know, politicians in this country say, look, we have a system for paying for this. You know, you, you take a student loan, you repay it over a long period of time. If you don't earn the money back, you don't have to pay the money back. It's charged over, you know, it's, it's never going to cost you a huge amount of the money you're earning. What's the problem? Yeah, on paper, that looks like, it, you know, it solves the problem. But in reality, when I hear the stories and they go, look, I've worked, you know, 10 extra hours. I'm doing all the work. We've got all the money from my parents. I've taken out the loans that are available to me and I can't afford it. Or I can afford tuition, but I can't afford any of the other things that are gonna make me a successful student. I can't afford um, a tutor. I can't afford to be part of the clubs where I'm gonna build the networks that will help me be the best physicist or best business person, whatever. So it's those soft issues and I'm looking at the big problem or we're looking at the bigger problem and saying, what helps you be among the people or are potentially among the people that put you in the place that you will be at the table for that coin flip that we talked about earlier. So do you think if, if government could do one thing to help the younger generation, it would be to return to an era of free university education? So, I mean, this is controversial, right? Because I have the experience of the US version, but if government could do one thing, they would make philanthropy better tax advantage. The gift aid process is helpful. It is, you know, there's a top up for what everyone gives, but you don't get the emotional satisfaction that you do in the US. You know, in the US, and I'm not saying the US is a perfect system, but when you make a contribution, it is directly deductible from your tax liability. And so people are motivated to figure out like, okay, if I don't think the government's doing a great job at redistributing these things to things I care about, I can do it myself and it comes off my taxes. When people give something to a charity or initiative here and it's topped up by gift aid, it is really helpful. I get an extra 25% on whatever anyone gives, but they don't feel the emotional connection to the end user or the initiative. So if there was one change that would help, that tax policy would change. I could think about 50 other things, but just that one would help change the face of philanthropy and, and grassroots giving and initiatives. You know, well, that across that the would country. certainly encourage more people like you. I mean, I, what I was putting to you is, should everybody just get free university education? We used to. We stopped a few years ago. Yeah. Should we go back to it? Uh, controversial question, but I would say no. I, I would say that um, I think that everyone should be afforded or have the ability to afford an education, but I don't think, or my personal view is that it should ever be completely free because when you pay for something, you care about it. So whether it's only a little bit, every one of the situations that we fund in our foundation I, I have satisfied or we have satisfied ourselves that they are putting in a meaningful contribution that really means that they, their parent or parents are paying attention to how they do. How do you choose them? Um, how, do you, how do you find a deserving person? Every which way. So first we solicit applications. And so um, anyone listening out there, if you find good students that are looking to close the gap on something, they're talented, committed, you know, they should look at the Blackheart Foundation and our website. So we get a lot of intake through there. Um, I, the number of initiatives that I'm involved in 
either on the board or mentoring, and we spread the word. Um, and what we've done over the years is we've gotten a bigger funnel of potential intake, but it's never enough. I want to find people, you know, to some extent, we're still a drop in the bucket. You know, we've funded 22 scholars. We just decided this week to go to 25. My goal is to get that to 50 to 100 and 200. And we've just started to build some partnerships where that looks like it is potentially going to happen. Um, so to some well, extent, other philanthropists, you mean, or uh, and organizations. Right. I think what happens is that we've had a long track record of, or medium long track record of success. Some other people are saying, "Well, this is something I should get involved in." I mean, there is the there's a bar to jump over where you go from being something that's interesting and grassroots to an accepted, well known, high caliber charity. And to some extent, we we haven't been our own worst enemies, but we've been been happy to work in privacy or semi-obscurity to just do what we're doing and change things one and two and five people at a time. But I think now we're on people's radar screen and people are saying, that's something I want to support or partner with. When you meet young people and they say, I want to be, I want, I want to get to where you are, right. or, you know, your, your, your position in life, do you explain to them what the gap is between the young kid who lacks confidence but is bright? And, and what you've become. Because what you've got, and I see this a lot across the table a lot, is you've got that, you've got that aura of success around yeah. you. You know, you are, um, you're, you're, you're well-spoken, you're charming, you look good, you're well-dressed. You've got that sort of sheen that rich, <laughs> successful people yeah. have. I'm glad so, you don't so have how, the old pictures. So how do, yeah. You, yeah. How, do you ever tell people how to get that? Well, first I, t I, I help them understand that like, you're seeing me on third base. I wasn't born on third base. I know it's an American vernacular baseball, but it's like, I wasn't born in this advanced stage. Like you just see the end. Cause I get plenty of kids that go, I want to be like you. I want to be wealthy and successful and have a good lifestyle and go on holiday. I'm like, right. Cause you're seeing me in my fifth, fifth, sixth decade, right? You're not seeing all the struggles before where I, like I didn't look good I was awkward I had to do hard well, things that's what I'm that's what I'm yes, getting at, yeah. yes all of the above you know they you don't see the, the you know the the teams that I got cut from in baseball and basketball and etc you know I played top level college basketball I'll just leave it there but I didn't play high school basketball I got cut from my high school basketball team my freshman and sophomore year my first and second year I mean people say like how could that be you played Division one college basketball, you played against Michael Jordan. How did how did you not play high school basketball? I'm like, yeah, because you don't see the whole picture. Now, I mean, I, I was also like five foot two when I started high school. I grew 12 inches in high school and 10 in college. So in addition to practicing and playing and being competitive, I also get some you know, physical benefits along the way. But people only see the end product. And what, what I try to remind the students that I talk to is that the struggle is real. You're going to be scared. It's going to be hard. But try to let fear be your tailwind and not the headwind. Because, it, you know, normalize it. It, it. It's going to stink. I said, it's work. I, I joke sometimes, like, it's work. If it wasn't work, it would feel like a beach in the Caribbean. It doesn't. It's work. Like, don't be afraid of hard work, because that's what it takes. But if, if all these hard edges have been knocked off you, are, are, have they? Have, I, I hope so. Well, yeah. that's the question. Today. Is, 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 this a, is this just a process that you've gone through of growing up and becoming successful? Or have you fashioned yourself? You know, how much of it has, has come from you deciding to do things and be a certain way and, and have a certain ethic? And how much is it an organic process that once you're on that path, right. it just kind of happens naturally? No, I think, I think there is a piece of me that has always been eternally curious about, you know, what is the next thing? What can I do? Um, I've never been happy with, you know, um, I'm much more interested in saying why than why not. Uh, a couple of things that I struggle with here, and I have two teenage daughters, and they'll, they'll tell you that the forbidden phrase in my household is, I can't be bothered. You know, like, I, I can't stand that. It's like, what do you mean you can't be bothered? You can't be bothered to breathe, live. <laughs> you know, have dinner, et cetera. So, um, so there's a piece of me that, you know, I know that probably f fits this, but I don't think that it is innate. I don't think that it isn't something that you can learn. There are plenty of things that I haven't done well that I've had to just make myself get better at. I think the second piece is that it's all part of a process. You know, as I start to think about 
you know, how I'm better at the executive CEO and chairman level of my business rather than being a day-to-day worker, doer, you know, senior contributor and, and work on that mix, you know, I'm starting to think about how do I curate the rest of my life? You know, and so I'm curious. So that's a process. I don't have 20 people that look like me, that have the same background as me, that were on all the best boards that can go, here's exactly what you're going to do. So just like they're trying to figure out, I'm trying to figure out, like, what is the right way to curate the next 20 years of my life? It's the process we're all going through, self-discovery. It's, um, it's really exciting and sometimes scary as all heck. The other thing that would have happened to you, though, from the moment you went to Dartmouth, is that you were surrounded by white people. So in, to culturally and in terms of behavior, how much of that do you think you've taken on and dished your, your own history? Well, I think I was surrounded by a lot of people. I mean, yes, maybe it was a predominantly white environment. And, and um, you know, I, th- I think I've already spoken to the fact that, like, I do believe that I develop skills that are, are a comfort or an ability or an aptitude to be in diverse settings and not let it make me feel like do I belong here? What am I doing, et cetera? That does not mean that I didn't feel that way several times along the way, because I certainly did, but I think I just had a lot of practice at it. So what do you say to young people who, who feel that discomfort? Practice, 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 get in the game. I mean, the truth is, is like, you know, what I've seen is, the, is that wonderful moment where some of those young people go from like, wait a minute, they're just as as uncomfortable as I am. So why don't I take control of the script? Why don't I take control of the mood here and engage with them? I mean, what I don't want to encourage is people being uh, disarming by patronizing themselves, right? That's just a bad bad pathway for anybody. But I think there are places where you can meet in the middle. You know, uh, there are plenty of times where I disarm people I have to. I'm six foot ten, black guy, right? Like I'm, you know. I, you know <laughs> sometimes I look in the mirror and I go, God, I'm like circus tall. I mean, like I'm really, really big. So I, you know, I've. It wasn't just because of my ethnicity. I think I had or learned a way where, like, I became or found ways to become approachable. And so, whatever your gift, or your difference is, I don't think it's something that you can't learn. Is your family all as tall as this? Um, I have two brothers that are 6'5 and 6'8, and I have two wonderful daughters that are track and field and netball athletes. One, my oldest one that's in University of the States, by the way, at Dartmouth, is six feet tall, and the younger one who's 15 is six foot four. What effects do you think being tall has on your outlook? I think think there's the dual effect. I mean, there's probably plenty, but I think the first one is that you're present. So you walk in the room, you're noticed. Good or bad, you're noticed, right? So... Um, they create some pressure on sort of what kind of, you know, effect you want to have in the room. I, I see my 15-year-old negotiating that now. People think, wow, she's wonderful and beautiful and stunning and well-spoken. And sometimes she just wants to be quiet and not be there. She wants to be a quiet 15-year-old. And other times um, she uses it and owns the room, even at 15. You know, I mean, so I think there's both of those. And I think my elder daughter that has a slightly different, you know, perhaps um, more, slightly more introverted personality has had to decide for herself, like, how do I want to approach the room? You know, and I think, you know, but it provides an opportunity, uh, perhaps some hardship, but an opportunity as well. Um, how, how many people like you now um, are doing the same sorts of things? You know, when you talk to your friends about what you're doing, how many of them say, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some money for that? Well, I, I think the bigger question is, you know, because the foundation, in addition to funding Blackheart Scholars, which we provide bursaries to, we also provide funding to organizations and initiatives that help provide the support to people like the scholars. And, and there is a great many people in this country that are doing it. I mean, I get a, a number of solicitations at the grassroots level, local, regional, et cetera. There's a lot of people. There's a big army of people that are trying to do good out there, and I'm really encouraged by that. Um, among friends and colleagues, I would say, you know, not enough. And I'm going to be controversial and call some of my friends out. They've been great. When I ask them to answer the call and join me to be in an event, to look after somebody, to counsel somebody, they're there. Um, do enough of them find the time to do something on their own? I'm still surprised by how few people do that. 
you know, that some people ask me sometimes, how do you find the time to do all the stuff you do? And I think, how do you not find the time to do a little something more? And I know that's a little bit obnoxious, but I see people that are really talented that for whatever reasons feel like they've doing enough between what they do at work, taking care of their family and the other things. It might be their extended family. Um, I think there's room for more. So that's where I'll be an adjutant or militant. I mean, that, well, that, that's, a, that's a big social phenomenon, really, isn't it? It is a big social It's happened over a long period of time. Right, yeah, well, I think it is. I mean, do you think you can turn it around? I don't think I could turn it around now, but I think I can, I can be an agent of change. I can help move some stones and once in a while drop a stone or two on someone's foot. Why do you think it's happening? I mean, are we, are we, are we those people you're talking about, I don't mean your friends, I just mean that, that type of person who could do more, do you think we're just more selfish? No, I think there's a lot of phenomena in effect there. I think first, I think one of the reasons that motivated a lot of people towards charity and philanthropy was started from the family. You learn values at home that said, we're gonna take care of ourselves. And you saw your mother, your grandmother, your grandfather, take care of the person next door that had a little less, right? You, you, you saw those examples. I think family and the notion of family and the definition of family is fractured over time. So that's just changed. I think that's one of the things. I think the second thing is, you know, and this is one that we'll just have to adapt to. The world is sped up. There's so much coming at us so quickly. I think people are truly overwhelmed by all that's in front of them. You know, you used to have time to think. It was slow news. You could read a newspaper. You could sit back, reflect. But now you get all of that in your hand held in a matter of seconds. You have to react to it. You have to have an opinion at it. You have, you have teenage daughters that are coming to you that have an opinion on it that you have to negotiate. Everyone's in every conversation. And I think there's a big part of our population that's just going, I I'm just trying to survive, right? But we're going to have to adapt because the world's not going to slow down. So you're British and American. I am. You, yeah, you're I you're, you're I am watching not. Brexit and division yes. on on <laughs> one side of the Atlantic and Trump and all of that on the other. Yeah. Uh, which do you find the most troublesome? <laughs> <laughs> that is a tremendous question. Um, I, I don't think you could even pick between the two. Talk about a coin flip about which disaster is worse. <laughs> Sorry, I am um, conveying my. Um, uh, my political leanings, I guess, perhaps in the U.S. Well, that's by a good saying thing, that. isn't it? I mean, oh, I think it is a good thing. Um, I'll speak to the local one. I, I think you know this isn't our finest hour in in the U.K. I think Brexit, no matter what your opinion is, I think was an emotionally emotionally charged decision towards a divorce that neither side can afford. I think it is a slow motion car crash that will end up with. Um, uh, more than a few injuries, but probably no fatalities. Um, and I think over some period of time, and not one I'm willing to predict because I don't know and I don't have the crystal ball, but I think we're going to wind up not too far from where we started, you know, in some kind of uncomfortable separation in which both sides, both parents declare some level of victory and we have visitation rights, relations, et cetera, that seem a lot like where we started but at a tremendous cost. As an investment manager, I mean, do you hold people's pensions in your Yeah, so we, in, we, in have, hands? we have corporate, I mean, corporate pensions and individual investors, wealthy families, et cetera, yes. Do you think they will suffer? Um, I think that um, in some period of time, I think there'll be volatility in markets that there could be a repricing of, of performance. But I think over the time, our job is to negotiate that to make sure that they don't suffer. And I don't, I'm not worried for the long-term value of the investment performance of the type of capital we manage, but along the way that you know, there will be some- So where is uh, the there, pain? There have some turbulence. Oh, there's pain along the way. I mean, you, you think about it. Let, let's use another example through 2008, the global financial crisis. I mean, we had a whole restructuring of our global economy. There was pain along the way, but we find our way back. You know, I'm, um, I jokingly, well, maybe jokingly say to my team all the time, Let's not, let's put aside the Armageddon moment, because I really do believe that 100%, the end of the world will take care of ourselves. Like we don't have to worry about the end of the world, it will take care of itself. So let's figure out what we do if it's not the end of the world. And I have great faith that it won't be pretty, it won't be with interim costs, but we're gonna find a way to muddle through. And, and I've seen that. I mean, if you look at it, the European Union, if you listen to Fox News, it should have been dead 15 times over the last 20 years. 
you know, I, it's funny, but it didn't slough off into the Mediterranean. Um, Greece is still here. Cyprus is still here. Italy, Spain, Ireland. I don't mean that their economic picture is always as comfortable as we want, but it hasn't changed. We're finding a way to muddle through to make it work. And I think, you know, we will. And do you think what you're trying to do with your philanthropy and encouraging young young black kids um, is is it easier or harder right now in 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 the environment in which we find ourselves of tension and argument over yeah. position and immigration and wealth and elites and all of those things? Um, so so I want to correct one thing because I want to make it clear. So so we are trying to help young black kids, but it's not just black kids. It's not really I, kids. it's under resourced kids. I mean, it doesn't matter what your ethnicity is if you've got a gap between your potential and what you can afford, then we want to help. Um, uh, it is, I don't know that it's harder. I think it is more needed. I think um, that, um, I think at some level, the world is open to helping more people in a greater fashion than it has been at any other time in history. I mean, that's my belief that the time's now. I think on the other hand, the world is fast moving and, and hard to figure out. And so you're a young person and you're thinking like, how do I do this? The opportunity or time to figure it out is this short. Like, you, you know, you don't have a long time to figure it out. And then once you figure it out, you don't have a long time to amass the resources to get you there and help you keep you there. So I think at some level, it's easier to help people because they're going, I figured out the first two pieces, but I can't figure out the last piece. And that's what we're trying to specialize in is providing the resources, financial and otherwise, encouragement, pastoral care, support for people to be able to do that, along you've, with a lot of other organizations. You've given me two concrete ways of changing the world. Well, you know, one was about um, tax and philanthropy. Right. Uh, the other was about everybody Everyone moving, moving a stone. stone. Yeah. I, I like to ask people if they, if they have one that they know is really, really controversial and hard to deliver. Do you have a sort of a secret one? If I could really take over, this is what I would do. No, I don't think I do. I think I have the humility that, like, you know, there, those two right there are pretty big. If I could get more people involved, I think we would, you know, I mean, I, I'm going to be careful about how many metaphors I use here, but, you know, I think we could create a wave that would be pretty significant. I mean, and I think the areas that focus on education, economic empowerment, and using our resources better, and diversity and inclusion, you know, making sure that we don't have the Jetsons Flintstones moment for whatever population a person is, I think those are pretty darn huge. I, I'm pretty comfortable that those are big enough to get stuck into for a very long time. Do, do you want to be more evangelical about it personally? I mean, what's striking is that, you know, here you are, um, you know, a, a rarity in your own industry, very successful, voted or, or you know, uh, uh, sort of decided as the, the number one guy on the power list for this year. Yet, in truth, your profile is quite low. You know, if you Google right. your name, you know, if you Google, uh, pe you know, people in comparable positions, yeah. you know, you will quite often get a lot of newspaper articles about them. Google you and you don't. Yeah. Uh, it's quite it's quite specialized. Is that a deliberate thing on your part or is that, do you think? The it's deliberate and, uh, deliberate and uh, uh, we haven't been, I haven't been seeking, you know, popularity to get the work done. I mean, I think. I think there's two things is that, you know, it was, I said to, to Michael Abode and the Powerless people, this is great. It feels like at some level a lifetime achievement award, but I'm not done. We're just getting started. I mean, I think what we did with Tristan and then our predecessor company with my partners, Curzon Global Partners, is we're happy to sneak up on you. Like, I want to just do the work. In the end, my goal is to do it so well that makes you feel like two things. One, that's aspirational. I want to get involved in two. I actually feel bad. What have I been doing sitting on my hands? So I think that's a little bit of the attitude with which, you approach, which we approach this. But what I'm also learning is that with, you know, the notoriety and the popularity of the power list and perhaps um, the seniority or semi-authority that comes with my age and level of accomplishment, I can have a multiplicative or geometric effect on some of the things I'm doing by getting the story out. So I want to try to strike the fine balance between not pandering to telling the story, but doing the work, but telling enough of the story where people go, if I only knew about this, we could have provided this much more help. And I think we're starting to be on the path to that now. Well, thank you very much indeed for coming in today and sharing your ways to change the world. Thank you very much.